Hello and welcome to another devlog. Today we want to show you how the mesh of our space gardens is generated. Since our game takes place on spheres, we had to come up with our own modified mesh creation. Most tutorials consider the common flat ground approach, which makes things a little bit easier. So we thought it might be interesting for you to see our method and maybe even helpful when you're tackling a similar problem. Oh, and also today I'm doing this commentary by myself, since we figured that it wouldn't be helpful for all of us talking in a jumble when trying to explain such a more technical aspect. Okay, so let's get started. First of all, the mesh is a data structure containing vertices as vector coordinates and triangles, which are basically triplets of vertex indices. So a mesh looks like this, and it represents the surface of our game world where the texture, or in our case a shader, will be rendered on. In our level editor, we define how the surface of our level should look like in the terraforming process. The challenge is then to calculate a mesh from the data created in our level editor. This data comes as functions, which have, of course, indefinite resolution. So you can kind of compare the original surface data to a vector image, which can be scaled unrestrictedly, which has to be converted to the mesh of defined size, a bit like a pixel image. I'm aware that this is a rough comparison, but I think it illustrates the key point quite nicely. One major requirement for the mesh is that it contains as little vertices as possible, which is important for performance. Of course, the more vertices we allow, the better the mesh data will fit the actual data. The physics of our game objects are calculated on this implicit data, while the rendering is done on the mesh. So when the mesh doesn't fit the actual data well enough, our characters will look like walking through the air, as you can see here with a mesh that has a way too low resolution. To define the proper balance between fitting of the rendered surface to the actual world surface, without compromising the performance too much, we define an error threshold for generating the mesh. It specifies what should be the maximum value for offset of any edge middle point of the mesh to the actual surface. And the offset is simply the shortest distance of a point to the surface. The lower we set the error threshold, the higher the resolution of our mesh will be. So when generating the mesh, we start with an ecosider with 12 vertices and 20 triangles, which looks like this. We start by setting all the vertices to the actual positions on the surface. We then recursively subdivide the mesh where needed depending on the specified error threshold. For that, we iterate through all triangles. For each triangle, we check every edge separately. We know that both endpoints A and B are already on their actual positions, derived from the surface data, which means their offset is zero. M is the center point of A and B. We calculate the offset of M to the surface. If this offset is smaller than the error threshold, everything is fine and we continue with the next edge. If the offset exceeds the error threshold on at least one of the three edges, we subdivide the whole triangle into four smaller triangles, like so, and set the newly created vertices on their appropriate positions on the surface. In the next step, we must consider the following important cases. Say, this triangle right here was found to be fine and will not be subdivided. However, it could be that on one edge a new vertex was created, because the neighboring triangle may have been subdivided, although this very point on the shared edge was fine. Since our mesh data structure demands to only consist of triangles, like I said in the beginning, we would have to divide this quadrangle into two triangles like so. And of course, it could also be that uh, two or even three of the edges would be affected by the neighboring triangles, so we have three cases right here. At the end of an iteration, we can consider all triangles that were not subdivided in step one nor in step two as fixed. Therefore, when we do the next iteration through the newly created triangles, we do not have to look at these fixed ones again. Subsequently, we iterate through this process until all triangles are fixed. So let's recap. We start with an ecosider with 12 vertices and 20 triangles. We then iterate over all triangles in a three-step process. First, we subdivide those triangles in which a midline point is too far off its supposed position. Second, we adapt those triangles that were not subdivided in the first place, but have a common border with a newly added vertex to ensure the mesh consists only of triangles. And lastly, we consider all triangles as fixed that were not touched in steps 1 or 2. So let's discuss what the benefits are and which parts are a bit problematic. We decided to go with this approach so that we could edit the surface of our levels live in our level editor. 
So every time we add or change a hill or a valley in our terraforming process, we simply rerun this algorithm to create a new mesh to the new implicit surface mode. By the way, if you're interested in how our in-game level editor looks like, we have also done a video on that. We'll put a link to that in the description. Another advantage of this approach is that we don't have to decide on the resolution of our mesh at the beginning of creating level, but can dynamically adjust it to the needs of our level. Here you can see how we play a bit with increasing and decreasing the resolution in the level editor. Of course, there are quite some challenges coming with this method. Although we can edit a space garden surface life, it is highly performance demanding. So most of the time it is a bit laggy, and for our needs that is no problem at all, but if we were to include the level editor as a feature in the final game, we would need to improve the performance quite a bit. One downside of our method specifically is that it's not optimized for sharp edges and steep hills. As you can see here, it requires way too many vertices at such structures. This is mostly because we implemented the mesh generation when we only had Gaussian hills, and the cylindric ones introducing those steep surface areas came after that. Alright, so we hope you got some insight into our approach to this mesh generation algorithm. As always, this is of course only one way to do it and there are certainly dozens of other options. We just wanted to share our thinkings here and we'd be happy to discuss them in the comment section. And it doesn't stop here. Naturally, the next step in the process would be to use this mesh to render a shader on top of it to give our surface an actual color. In our case, the color depends on the slope of the surface, as you can see at our cylindric hills. In this way, the side walls have a nice brown color separate from the grass texture on flat surfaces. Also, the color changes dependent on the distance from the planet's center to implement different layers. If you're interested to hear more about all this, we can of course make another video on that as well. In one of our next videos, we want to have a look at how we managed to implement the different kinds of hills. We have Gaussian ones and cylinders, as I mentioned before, but also rectangle ones. We are also going to look into how we have different modes for them when they overlap, and how the objects we place in level adapt to the terrain. So thank you very much for watching and see you in the next devlog. Thanks for watching. Join our Discord channel to stay in touch or even playtest our game. We will organize regular game sessions in which you can play with us, discuss new features and even bring in your own ideas. We are convinced that deep space gardening can become a whole lot better with the input of a community. So we invite you to participate in our development process with your feedback. Also, if you want to support us, please subscribe to our channel and share this video with your friends.